Hey, it's uh, Stephen Van Camp and Lewis. It's November 1st, uh, the day after Halloween, of course, here in the United States. Today's main topic, though, uh, is going to be about ceratopodiums and what to do with them in fall. Um, they are... Ceratopodiums are, are known from Florida all the way south through Brazil in, in the sort of central Brazilian plateau uh, or the... Um, the Cerrado is, is really the, the main uh, biological hotspot for those guys. And most of them are terrestrial. Uh, so I grow most of mine in a, a mixture of uh, about 50-50 sand and peat moss, not sphagnum moss, peat moss. So it's an actual soil mix in clay pots and they get full sun uh, all year round <clears throat> here in Texas, even in the summer, in the dead of, in the dead of summer when it's really, really hot. Um, but this time of year, you know, I, I start to watch them going dormant in, in, in a very similar manner to the catacetums. Uh, so what happens is the lower leaves will start to, to fall off. You know, I'll, I'll pull the, um, the slow release fertilizer out if there's any left. And then I'll slowly back off on watering until they, they go fully dormant. And they don't get water for, you know, three or four months uh, in the same way that the, the catacetums do. Um, sort of the difference between the seropodiums and the catacetums is with catacetums, of course, you want to let the roots get four inches long or, or more if possible until you start watering. Uh, the seropodiums are, are not nearly that, that picky. Um, you, you don't really have to worry about, I like to let the roots get about this long. I'm kind of estimating how long they are inside the dirt, but, uh, and then I'll just start pouring the water on and, and kind of like the catacetums, the, you know, just start watering. There's no reason to let them dry out basically uh, until they go dormant again. So at this time of year, um, much like my catacetums, my, my seropodiums are pretty much still very active. So I'll show you some of those and, and show you how to care for them. Uh, I've also got some imports that I got a couple months ago and they're sprouting. And then I got another one this week. Um, from Floralia, but I'll talk about that in a moment. So first of all, uh, I'm going to show you one that goes dormant and one that doesn't. There's, so I've I've been growing ceratopodiums, I should say, for about five years, five or six years. Um, so I am probably not the world's expert on this, and I want all of y'all to know that. So what I'm telling you today is. Um, it's sort of the, the tips and tricks that I've I've found work, and that uh, friends of mine who grow these uh, work for them as well. So first, uh, like I just said, I'm going to show you uh, one of these species that goes dormant, and then I'm going to show you one that does not go dormant, and then I'll show you some some of the larger plants that I have that that will go dormant, and I'll also talk about some media. Uh, sort of the you know the epiphytes versus the terrestrials. So um, we're going to start with Ceratopodium varescens here, and this is one that does go dormant. Here is the name for varescens, and this is this is really a goal. You know, when you're growing any of these plants, your goal is to have the newest pseudobulb larger uh, by the time they go dormant than than the previous ones. So. You know, I had good growths on these guys, and then this year it just exploded with growth. And I think uh, um, that that might be in large part due to the plant is getting itself is getting larger, um, but also maybe the fertilizing regimen that I had with this new purely organic might have had something to do with it. Um, but you can see this is a big bulb. <clears throat> so here's my hand compared to it, and here's the plant itself. You'll notice plenty of roots, sand, and peat in a clay pot. And these guys are in full sun. Actually, that's their home there. Typically, when they're not in the greenhouse, they just kind of all sit together. And they get blasted with full Texas sun until, basically from sunrise until um, mid-afternoon, so about 3.30 or 4 p.m. And this one, uh, like most of the seropodiums, will bloom in spring. So as it's putting out a new bulb, it'll simultaneously put out a new spike and you'll get this big spray of flowers and I'll show a photo of, of one of the ones 
that I had blooming from the spring. Now this particular one has not bloomed for me and it is, Varescens is absolutely beautiful. I'm really excited to see this one bloom in the spring and with a big fat bulb like that, I'm expecting it to bloom. This one over here is one that I recently chopped up and sold the division of. This is Certipodium flavum. Let me see if I can clean that tag off for you a little bit there. Certipodium flavum. This has been called a lot of things over, over the years. Um, it is a, a beautiful yellow one. And this is actually, this is also terrestrial, but it's one that does not go dormant. So you can see it, it's a, a fairly compact species. You know, cert certipodiums are known for being very large and unwieldy, but uh, this is about as small as it gets. And so, you know, it, it's probably large cat laici, so any of you growing at home could probably cut your teeth on, on one of these flabums. Uh, this is interesting. This is one that does not go dormant. If you give it a dry winter rest, it'll just straight up die. So I move this uh, away from my, my other certipodiums in wintertime, and I continue to water you know, once or twice a week. <clears throat> I've actually had this one bloom for me uh, two times in a year when it's not holding a pod, as you can see here. I fertilized this in the spring. Uh, James Rose over at Cal Orchid had requested another pod from this guy, so uh, I'm gonna send him this and hopefully he'll get some, some flasklings back in a couple of years. But again, beautiful, nice little yellow, uh, yellow flower on big, big inflorescences. Here are some of the big boys that I have. Um, when we're, you know, I just mentioned uh, certipodiums can get very large. Um, these are the ones that we're talking about. So this particular one is St. Ledgerianum. Uh, and this is the smaller of the two larger ones, but it's still a very hefty plant. Uh, I chopped this up and sent a piece to Florida over to, to Todd, um, who's got a, a YouTube channel as well. Uh, unfortunately, those back bulbs didn't do well for him, so I'm going to see if I can send him something else instead. But you notice that this one's in spag. <clears throat> um, you see lots of aerial roots here, so this particular species is an epiphyte and grows on palm trees. And I've had great success growing this one in spag uh, in a clay pot as well. But the monster back here behind it, this is punctatum. This is the species that's from Florida. Let me see if I can move this out of the way here for you. And you can see this one's in a terrestrial mix. And it is, uh, again, about 50-50 sand and peat. And this one will go dormant and it won't get watered for several months. But you can see from bottom all the way up to... So I have my arm straight out. I'm six feet, six feet one inches tall. And so this is probably a good five, five feet or so tall. Um, very large plants. These are the, the so-called cowhorn orchids that you see in Florida, growing on trees in the Fakahachi Swamp. Hopefully I said that right. Uh, if I did, I apologize to everyone in Florida. <clears throat> but you can see how big this bulb is compared to my hand behind it. Again, this one will go dormant. Finally, back to the table, I do want to show you all some of my imports. I got these from Floralia as I, I and I talk about Floralia fairly regularly. Um, <clears throat> this is Certipodium blanchetti. And of course, this was shipped to me uh, a month or two ago, which would have been uh, the end of winter for Brazil. And so I've got them in my, my terrestrial mix. I've got a new growth coming up just below my thumb here is one of the purely organic chunks that sort of hardens and then slowly dissolves over time as a fertilizer. I've watered this a few times, but I'll probably let this plant get quite a bit larger before I really start hitting it with water. Maybe, you know, maybe a hand size larger. So when that plant is uh, uh, quite a bit larger, I'll, I'll start hitting it with water significantly. This is another import from Floralia. This is Alice, and is one of the, the pink certipodiums. Also terrestrial, as you can see by the mix. Also just starting to grow. Um, again, you know, once this is about a hand size larger, then I'll start watering it in earnest. But until then, 
um, I'll, I'll keep it fairly dry just to let the roots kind of come in and then you can see here again this some of that purely organic mix and due to some some COVID reasons all my plants were delayed uh, from Floralia so they came back to the U.S. and sent me um, another one that they had they had missed unfortunately but it is what it is and I got this beautiful Certipodium gigas and as you can imagine a gigas will be <clears throat> it should be a fairly large plant and as you can see by the mix it's a uh, it's not a terrestrial this is an epiphyte a uh, nice new growth coming in come on camera there we go nice new growth coming in and it should um it should grow nicely for me. One of the things that I've noticed with certipodiums is thrips. You can see those little white dots all over that guy? This is the main problem that I have with certipodiums. Um, you know, I'll treat it a couple times and it, they'll get knocked back and then they'll come back. Um, I found that while the thrips are fairly common to the certipodiums, they don't necessarily seem to they don't seem to really hurt the big strong plants. However, this plant is is freshly off uh, off the out of the box from Brazil, so I'm going to hit it with some some um, pesticides and knock those thrips down. Anyway, uh, have a great weekend, and I'll see y'all later.